morning uh, and, and welcome. I think I'm, I'm excited. I think this is going to be exciting. Um, I uh, wanted to kick off. Oh, this is perfect. I could work the crowd this way. Mm -hmm. So just uh, so we um, had this idea of just trying to do something here in Sacramento, something I think is really, um, really important. Um, I think that uh, as you hear, this seems kind of loud, but you'll, um, you hear about the, the you've seen the, the agenda. We have some great star-studded speakers, uh, and I'm really excited. Um, and some of them who came red-eye in, maybe red-eye out, so I'm really excited that we were able to pack the house and, and really show that the capital city, you know, and, and I, I think it's something that we hope that we could continue to generate um, conversations, and so you have a really nice, uh, we spent some time thinking about how we wanted the day to go. So anyway, so I thought I'd kick it off, and I'd start, let's start off with the, um, the, let's see, this is click forward. So I would, so my talk is putting the H back into nephrology. Now, if you were to do this in Spanish, this would be a no-go, right? Because there's no H in nephrologia. But we'll go ahead and start. So it's, I want to be in the spirit of go ahead and maybe for this talk, I'm going to spell my name with an H. So I'm going to go ahead and put H into Jose Morphine, all right? So here are my financial disclosures. So where's the H? So how are we doing? How are we doing with this? And the program that we all here, mostly in this room, see this every day, whether you're on the acute side or you're doing outpatient. So I'll go a little bit about some familiar information, but maybe an angle of about where we could do better and how we could do better. A little bit about heart of the matter, and you're here um, from Dr. McCullough a little later. Humanizing medicine, which you're here a little bit over. I think this should run through the day in terms of how do we have patients be at the table in decision making, and how do we empower them? And then home, is there a better place, right? Is there a better place than home? So these are going to be the four concepts. So we're going to start off with this. And I don't know, a show of hands, how many people have seen Green McFrost? Right, you probably, and if you see in those hands, how many times have you seen it? Probably in that same hand, maybe one or two times. So this is one of my first patients. And the reason why I put this picture up is that this is not what we see now. I mean, this is an almost reportable, and I think every fellow should see this because it reminds us of what maybe yesteryear was. What was it like to take care of a patient who was uremic and was pretty much an invalid, as is described, and I see Dr. Detmer shaking his head forward because I think that this was my first patient actually at UC Davis, and we had a BUN of 300, creatinine of about 30. Again, you post those numbers up on the whiteboard and say these are records, but this is really the um, exception because, and it, you know, I think that we're very thankful for the evolution of kidney replacement therapy. And uh, just a kind of overview of the timeline of the Colf dialyzer in 1943 and then the Noble experiment as described by Bell and Scribner and Clyde Shields and the Scribner shunt to do a therapy not just to rescue patients from danger and the depths of symptoms, but to continue to do dialysis, right? So this is really the birth of what we do. And then we all know about the um, death committees and really an allocated resources or very few patients. If you're over the age of 45, you weren't offered dialysis. If you were mentally unstable, and even some of the young teenagers patients. So there really were a lot of exclusionary effects. And no one here is saying we should go back to those times. Thankfully, we, you know, at the time before the ESRD, we had 40% of patients doing dialysis at home. Then you had the entitlement program of Medicare, which really was able to launch us into where we're at now today. And so the trade-offs for early for home dialysis was really control, independence, freedom, reducing travel time and flexibility, much of what we promote now in terms of home dialysis. The disadvantages were, you know, maybe the cumbersome setup, maybe older technologies and support, and these are things we deal with now. So really, it's 40% of the patients at the time were doing dialysis at home. And so with that came some dollars. And dialysis has always been about funding. How do you f support a program that is growing and we know there's been a lot of growth and the demographic has changed. We have older patients, perhaps even sicker patients that are on the therapy. So refinement of the dialyzer, of the hollow fiber dialyzer, and then the emergence you know, of uh, the peritoneal dialysis using you know, the Popovich sort of 1978, sort of thinking about peritoneal dialysis. And you know, I don't know if you remember the peritonitis rates back then, but it was one in three to four patient months. 
in terms of, so we've come a long way in terms of improving the technique of peritoneal dialysis. And so, um, so I think as we sort of look at today and we think about a very familiar sign, I think that looking at sort of maybe a slight dip down in mortality per year, we're still having a high index of burden and not only on the patient, but also on the system. And I think we've been on a lot of, um, you know, the, I sort of call it conventional hemodialysis, where now we do almost 90% of the patients in the center, sort of full assist, where we've created sort of a, a way of streamlining. And if you were thinking about how was things, how are we gonna keep patients, 200,000 patients, or how are we gonna keep 100 patients alive? You know, you were gonna try to take a resources so precious and try to make sure you're able to distribute it amongst the community, right? No one's here gonna say, well, we're gonna just keep five people feeling really well, and the other 95 people are not gonna do well. So, I mean, I think you can't fault for the way you evolve into these centers of excellence. And now, sort of with a lot of the oversight, I think we've um, had to think about how are we engaging patients? And this is an example of how you do, this is a patient coming in, um, how do we have patients do more and this is in the, in the backdrop of sort of a growing population of patients. This is around, this is US RDS looking at demographic and the baby boomers and you have an older patients. Patients are older and perhaps even sicker with the higher comorbidity index than they were in 1973. So we have to sort of think about, you know, how do we sort of re-engage and how do we think population specific, how we could do this. And this is also kind of looming, especially if you're the younger patient patient waiting for transplant, and you hear this often, we're waiting for transplant. I'm not going to do, go to school, I'm not gonna work because I'm disabled, because I'm on dialysis. Even though they're driving the car to the, the dialysis unit and driving the car away from the dialysis unit, and they're waiting for a transplant. And you know, we look at places across the country and you can see that the transplant rates are flat. In this, in Davis, we're still sort of somewhat compared to the rest of the state, we're actually reasonable for type O in terms of six year waiting list. But we know that in many markets it's eight to 10 years, like in Los Angeles for type O. So while you sit there and wait, every day on dialysis, your mortality is up and up and up. So, I and mean, this is sort of another way of looking at the number of patients that will get transplanted and very few, you know, one out of five patients are even on the list and then waiting 3% to be transplanted, and you can see that m many patients will have to be on the list for at least five years or more, and during those five years or more on the list, because remember, only the patients who are healthy on dialysis get on the transplant list, right? This is different than liver transplant, where the sickest patients with the highest MEL scores get on there. So we have to have patients do well. They have to use, they have to um, be thriving. They have to be doing well on dialysis, and this is sort of, looking at projections of the utilizations of 650,000 patients by 2025 and looking at how many, 85% if we continue at these rates in prescribing dialysis in the center, you need to grow centers, you need to increase by 40%. So that being said, we're gonna need a workforce. You need a workforce to follow these patients, to manage these patients, to optimize these patients. You need staff, the shortage is real. I mean, the ratios of nephrologists for patients now are probably larger than they probably ever have been. Um, you know, the, the magic number is like 60 to 80 patients, and there's been some studies that show that if you have more than X number of patients that you maybe put patients at risk. Um, this is sort of how the current mix needs is you have more centers, you need more staff, and we know all those, and I know there's some of our staff and those who are in dialysis clinics every day know what I'm talking about when you feel like you're always chasing the next staff and um, not having enough staff to do dialysis in the centers. And the nephrologists in this room know that, and I can speak to this because I have over 20 clinics I go to, the windshield time is real, right? Being in the windshield, being in the car and ordering it, you know, in and out, it gets kind of boring after a while. It gets tiring after a while. Never mind, I don't do the in and out. But, it <laughs> but you're running. You're running from one unit to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And it's um, feel like you're chasing your tail, and though this is really on, this has been I've seen this slide since I was a fellow, or I was even an intern, looking at oh, there's a shortage of nephrologists, and the costs are going up, right? There's X number of patients, and there's X X X X X number of dollars going into the Medicare system, and so this is something that has really put a lot of emphasis on how do you control cost. How do you come up with an environment where you be more judicious, 
with the dollar that is being given to you to take care of the patients and make sure that you're reducing hospitalization, having patients using utilization of medication. So this is the bundling environment and other models of that to try to control costs because this is on CMS's radar. We're, we're on the radar, right? Um, and this is sort of an example of that, right? This everybody knows about this John Oliver HBO, which was politically charged, you know, maybe fair or unfair, but this is what the public eye, so perception is reality for the public, right? They're, they're seeing the messages and we're actually in the clinics and we're actually in front of patients. So we have a completely different perspective. We know what the issues are. But when you have the public eye says, oh my God, what are you guys doing there? So this is really where, where a lot of the energy about what we're doing. So heart of the matter. Um, so again, I think we went into nephrology to take care of kidneys and patients, right? We didn't think about being cardiologists. And over the last, probably say a good decade or so, there's been emerging inf information and evidence about thinking more about heart. And I'll just go a little bit over this because I know Dr. McCullough will have a whole talk on this, but the five-year survival, again, this is a slide very familiar to you, looking at the causes of mortality that basically five, two out of five patients, you know, will be alive in five years or so, 40% mortality, and that's much higher mortality rate than colon cancer, leukemia. So again, if you put that in the context and if you have these sort of sense and we see this, you realize that, that, that we have a ways to go. And here's the, the leading cause of death is cardiovascular. You know, 40% of our patients of those who die are due to cardiovascular. And again, stenting the LAD will only go so far. We know that they're dying of arrhythmias and this is really is where they're generating a lot of uh, inquiry and a lot of investigations of what is happening during dialysis. So again, if we learned early on in our training and our time that you can't, what you can't say the word ESRD without LVH, right? If they don't have LVH, they haven't been on dialysis long enough, right? That's, that's sort of kind of the, the tenant, but you know, so we have patients who do, do come to end stage renal disease with pre-existing conditions, diabetes, hypertension, so on and so forth. Um, and so myocardial stunning is something that you've been hearing now. And you've been hearing that even in centers about saying, how do we deal with ultrafiltration rates? And nice studies that have been looking at uh, Chris McIntyre showing really nice visuality of like what happens to the myocardium during a run of dialysis when there's hypotension and what is this prolaxed, what is this long effect? And could potentially that be the cause of why patients have a high risk of mortality on the first day of the week? Is there something about what we do on the last day of the week that is a precursor for what happens on the first day of the week in terms of where their risk of mortality is the highest? So again, these sort of, these persistent regional abnormalities that are related to flux of dialysis, hypotension during dialysis, that have been associated with ultrafiltration rates. And again, ultra fluid management is one of the hardest things that we do. That's no different than when we saw patients in the hospital with normal kidney function. We say, do we, I hang? How much saline do I give the patient? How much Lasix do I give the patient? Um, the difference here is that you have a machine here that actually could take, you could tell the patient how much to remove versus giving someone a slug of Lasix. And so this fine balance between fluid overload and fluid underload causes a cascade of things. And two thirds of our patients are in this conundrum, this quagmire of figuring out where's the fluid balance. And doing target weights and pre and post weights is really, really playing with very little instruments on how to really find the effect of fluid management. So this is really challenging, you know, because we don't want to have the patients end up with fluid overload either. You know, that's also related to higher morbidity and mortality. And so trying to sort of go, well, how do we end up with fluid removal, which leads to a whole input of sort of leading to multiple uh, RAS activation. If you have patients who have a low effective circular volume, that's more likely to lead to hypotension, a compensatory increased heart rate, increases demand on sort of this microvasculature of ischemia and low oxygen uh, content, which could lead. So it's really, it's a perfect setup in terms of the structural changes that are happening to the heart and the constant stress test that happens with the patient who does a session of dialysis, a session of hemodialysis. 
And so this is really where we struggle. And so again, clinical benefits, I'll just kind of give an overview of how, why we think about more frequent hemodialysis where we really you think about at least 60% to 70, 80% of the patients would fall maybe in this category. There's patients on both ends, patients who perhaps have a lot of residual function who don't need, but if you take your typical bell-shaped curve patient, you know, if you're looking at trying to improve their overall, not only survival, but their overall quality of life, is trying to figure out how do we talk about recovery time, which is an associated ultrafiltration rate. How do we reduce two days without dialysis and not put that patient at risk on the very first day uh, of the week? How do we control blood pressure? How do we control phosphorus control? You know, how do we prevent myocardial stunning? How do we reduce LV mass? And it ultimately what I think patients probably value the most, and I think we all would agree in this room, is quality of life. How do we improve their quality of life? How do we get them back to work? How do they feel part of society where they feel that dialysis is supposed to be here? Dialysis is supposed to be them to rehabilitate the patient. That's what those great Bells and Scribbins said. It's supposed to rehabilitate patients. If it's not rehabilitating the patient, then it's not working. Dialysis isn't working if they're not feeling better. I just spent about a half an hour with a patient that is really not doing well, not doing well. He's been on dialysis for three months, and they said, my doctor told me that I would feel well three months into dialysis. He's doing terribly. He's getting weaker. He's getting tired. So we had a whole conversation about this, a conversation about how do we do better. So let's humanize medicine. How do we put a face onto dialysis? You know, I think oftentimes with the operations, it's, it, it feels like it's the machines. The machines, you know, rounding, it's like we look at the machine, patients are sleeping, right? And then, so it's how do we sort of think, and I think for us who promote home therapies or promote self-care, this is at the crux of what we're talking about. It's the stories about patients, it's the narratives that continue to be built that really, I think, energize us to do the work that we do. So the Institute of Medicine knows what this is about, and we sh this is sort of the fabric of how we try to measure quality, effectiveness, efficiency, safety, equity, timely access, and patient-centered care, you know, patient-centered care. And so you're hearing that, patient-centered care. What is patient-centered care? So we want to look at core principles. It has to be customized to reflect the patient's needs. It's not about us. It's we have to meet the needs of our community. We have to meet the needs of what the patients need, the values or choices, knowledge, you want to provide an environment of comfort, peace. Family and friends have to be part of this conversation and you have to have transparency, safety. Patients, you want them to be the source of control. And with that, you have to not just say, take over. You have to get them to engage. You have to get them to trust you to engage. And then they have to be considered as part of the team. You are a consultant. They are the player. They are the ones who are on the field. Right, you in many ways are sort of a spectator, but you are engaging, but they're the ones who are gonna execute because there's 164 hours a week and it's not just on dialysis, it's everything around dialysis and then relationships and then the shared decision-making, which is shared decision-making for those of who may not be familiar with it is really simply a bi-directional conversation where we're not taking a paternalistic approach and tell patients what to do, but we engage them and say there are choices so a life-threatening disease like end-stage renal disease, where several treatment options are available for different possible outcomes. This comes out of the oncology research. This is what oncologists talk about. There's therapies. We're, we have options. It's not just in-center hemo, which is the default mechanism. Patients should be aware of what those options are at all times. And it's part of our mandate by CMS and conditions of coverage. But we know that this has to be a constant message. It shouldn't be on the first day of intake with paperwork to say, oh, by the way, there's a fox here that says there's an option to do home, but you don't, probably don't want to do that. Or the med you don't say that, but you know, we're going to give you a nice duffel bag and there's some massage and some nice you know, happy nurses and you'll be happy in the center. You know, and it, it's the messaging. No one comes back on 30 days, 90 days to say, so are we thinking about options for home dialysis or when are we gonna do home dialysis, especially when you see a patient that you feel would do great at home, right? But they just aren't ready or there's a lot of challenges for them to get there. So patients, do patients feel informed? So this is a review of how to, how, if you survey patients, how often do, are they feel, and the, and, the, and the green is the no and the 
orange is a yes in terms of how, where are some areas where we're missing the mark on full disclosure? How long will you live with and without dialysis? You know, I think most of the patients in this survey didn't know that answer. You know, some of the other uh, finer points of burden of the therapy, the doctors ask about values, again, concepts of patient-centered care. You know, a few of them even acknowledge yes. And then not starting dialysis even being an option. You know, no one even got that. I mean, that to me was the most striking. It's like, they didn't even offer, like, don't do dialysis. You know, and again, there's some scenarios where it's appropriate to have that conversation. You know, you're, you know, have comorbidities. It's like, I always use dialysis, like getting on a train. And you're getting on that train, if you're wounded from other reasons, I mean, you're probably not gonna do very well. Dialysis isn't a magic bullet for every single disease. But I think that this really gets to the point that there we're missing the mark and we need to do better in informed consent. Um, how do we offer patients a, a confidence to thrive? Again, trying to really uh, unravel the messaging of disabilities, unravel the message of being sick and you're too weak um, on dialysis. And again, if they're too weak on dialysis, then we need to figure out why they're so weak on dialysis. We want to avoid the disabled label. We want to minimize the sick image. You want to reinforce. Someone who is feeling sick, they're not going to want to participate, right? They're going to feel they're too sick to participate. So you have to sort of say, well, how do we make you less sick? Or how do we work through some of the fear and maybe some of the disengagement, which oftentimes requires a little bit more time, right? And so I think that these are really, and those who do successful home programs know that this is basically the this, this is the constant that runs through in trying to offer support and again, to continue to change the culture. And there's a circle. It's not just a magic bullet where it could be a constant coaching, constant motivational coaching to keep patients working through this disease. And so is there a better place than home? I watched this movie at one point. I don't know, it's been a while. It's a good picture. So currently, this is where the numbers, I mentioned earlier, 90%. And I think many of us in this room feel that we could get to at least 30%, 30, 35%, right, at least. And there are some people that think 50% is what we should be shooting for. Again, we could argue, but clearly we all think we could do better than this. And so 12% is very, very uh, disappointing, and it's pretty, pretty, pretty stagnant, um, even in the more recent uh, USRDS. If anything, there's been a little bit of a dip, but there's work to be done. And, I, and here's some survival. This is looking at some daily home hemo patients doing five to six days um, from 2006, seven to 2010. They basically looked, I think, about over 4,000 patients and they did propensity score matching. So try to compare apples to apples to a daily hemodialysis survival patient versus a uh, three times a week. And you can see the mortality sort of was improved for patients doing daily home hemodialysis. And again, this is probably not uh, too surprising. Um, you know, certainly there's always the potential for not controlling for everything because this is a uh, observational study looking at survival. But, you know, if you look at all the benefits I explained earlier, it's in, in addition to maybe it's a different uh, person driving the train, maybe a patient who's more activated, that's going to be hard to control. But I think that these are the w w one way or the other, if you're going to give a choice, I think I'd rather be on that top curve in terms of survival and feeling well. And then this is looking at HHD versus PD patients. Again, similar type of analysis, looking at propensity score matching to try to compare two equal groups. And you could see that in the first patients who started dialysis in the first six months, they had similar risk profile in patients with HHD versus patients who had peritoneal dialysis and it considered. So, and I think you've, you know, we'll hear more about that this morning, but technically, you know, I think for all of us, we agree that therapies could be very um, uh, successful and it's just a matter of getting patients to, um, and our programs to support the patients. And again, this is kind of an overview of where we're doing with, how do we, you know, in order to have patients do more home dialysis, you don't just say, here, here's the machine, go, go with it. You have to create schools. You have to have training centers, centers of excellence. And so this is an area if you have, in order to have training, just like having an in-center program, if you don't have enough chairs for an in-center program, you can't admit patients. Doing home dialysis is no different. You have to have centers of excellence and you have to have availability on demand to be able to take care of and train and be successful to have a critical mass of patients so they can actually do well and have the best possible outcomes. And you can see that you know, there's been uptick in the number of PD patients, of uh, PD training programs and patients doing um, PD and home hemodialysis. 
and again, I think there's still a lot of work to be done on that end. But again, and if you look a little bit further, I've showed this slide over and over again because I think there is a lot of interest in self-care. There are some centers or some communities or some patients that just don't have the quote unquote details to go in to bring the baby home or do the training at home to commit 100%, but maybe they can commit 50%. Maybe there's an avenue where we actually could get them to do more. Analogous would happen in the 80s and 90s for some of, you know, some of our staff here who were dialyzing patients, self-care model was very much promoted, right? It was now we use a ratio of techs to nurses to patients, but back when we had the shortage or we were just upscaling the, 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 the programs, we were use, allowing patients to come in and set up their own circuits, put their own needles in. We moved really far away from that but I think some of us feel like that also is another way of really empowering patients to take over their access for those who are doing hemodialysis. This survey would suggest that patients could do more self-care as defined by, you know, cannulation, setting up their own machines, taking their own vitals, getting their own weights, that patients could do more. And we see this as why we could get more patients home. Now, we do have a critical mass of patients that just need to be activated. They're in the centers. They just need to be educated, they have to have access to the patients, and they need to be promoted. And so nephrologists would do this. Um, health professionals, patients, um, professionals who are in the kidney industry would agree that they would do home dialysis for themselves, right? And if I go to meetings, I think the only person who raises a hand that they would go in the clinic if they started, if they had kidney disease or if they needed dialysis, the only hand that goes, you know, there's two hands that go up when asked that question in a room of like 50 to 80 patients, 50 or 80 part audience. And it's usually the medical director who has to raise his hand that he would dialyze or he, he or she would dialyze <laughs> in the center and maybe the facilitating administrator or the center manager would say, yeah, me too. We'll go down together. But <laughs> the point is that we realize that this is an underutilized resource. And we know that if you even survey those same nephrologists, they would tell you that they think 30 to 40% of patients could do home dialysis also. So there's a disconnect. They, we feel that they could do it, we would do it, but why aren't we doing it? And so why can't more patients? This is actually a survey looking at 250 patients. So they surveyed patients about questions about self-care, weighing themselves, disinfecting the machine, or I'm sorry, disinfecting the chair, basic stuff, taking vitals and then self-cannulation. And you could see the disconnect between what patients thought they could do, percentages on the, on the right-hand column, and what they th no, the nephrologist thought they could do, a disconnect in terms of patients feeling that they could do all these tasks and nephrologists feeling that they couldn't do these tasks. So I think there is some work also to be done with sort of getting our nephrologists and, and our staff and our uh, professionals to get them um, you know, engage, because we all have biases. We have biases about who can do what, and again, any of us who've been doing this for a while, you just can't predict, right? The guy with the MD, the person with basic literacy, and then maybe no formal, maybe even a language barrier, the other patient may even do better than the MD. And so you don't know, you can't assume anything. You know what happens when you assume, right? right? There's also, there's also a word in there that says sue me and assume, so we have to be careful <laughs> with that. So the delayed of patient referrals, we know if the patients come late to the game and they're coming late to a nephrologist, they're more likely to start with the CVC, right? If their disease presents later because you can't predict the unpredictable in acute kidney injury on whatever CKD, then they're gonna come late. So we know that there's just so how the world turns, there's gonna be challenges in when the patients come to dialysis. And so the patients that you see in your clinic, who are you managing along, manage along, those patients, you have plenty of lead time to have these conversations about modality choices. So I think that when you present late, you're referred late, those patients are on a track for in-center. And we know that there's very few of those convert you know, under two, 3% will convert to a home therapy once they're on that track. And I think we could do better with that. So the structured programs, education, education, we gotta get our fellows and our fellowship training. First, we have to have our fellows, we have, we need a, we need bodies <laughs> first. <laughs> Second, when the bodies are coming in, we need to really emphasize home dialysis, right? Because they practice what they learn. If they didn't learn 
how to speak another language, they won't be able to speak another language because they won't feel comfortable. So this is why education programs are important to really engage even those who are just out of fellowship training because there's always, as we say, continuous. This is a CME event, yeah, CME. Yeah, it's, we want a continually modality education. And then the perception of, like I said earlier, I kind of hinted at that throughout the talk about what our own perceptions of what patients can and can't do. So I think many times it's when you look at a, um, a center or a practice that has less than, you know, really disappointing number of percentages and they say, well, we just don't have patients here. And they have 2,000 patients, right? 24 clinics, I've got, well, where are all these patients? Well, we don't think they could do it. I mean, and it's like, I would never go in front of a camera and tell a patient that I don't think they could do it, right? Because we've heard stories of patients showing up to the doctor's office and tapping on their shoulder and say, why didn't you tell me about this? Why didn't you tell me that this therapy could actually make me feel better and actually could live longer and actually could get a transplant? Why, why? And it's like, it, it's, it's tough to, to, to defend that. And then so I think this is where we could do better in doing the education. And again, I think we need also support our staff and support our physicians to have better programs that are more integrated with the existing culture. So if you're trying to change culture, you need to start changing the freeways. You can't you know, have someone on the five or the 405 in LA and then think someone over on the 10 or the five, you have to somehow have a way of bridging the freeways so there could be more crosstalk and not be sort of us versus them because we just don't know what they do or what, what we do. And I think these are some of the things that I think are developed and try to make it more accessible, not only for the patients, but also for the providers to be able to send someone to quote unquote, I'm gonna send them to school, I'm gonna send them to so and so, so we could actually have time to have a conversation about kidney disease and what kidney disease looks like and what are the options for kidney disease rather than sort of doing a checkbox, which oftentimes happens because of time. We're all pressed for time. So we're really asking for a climate change. We're asking for ways that we could think about dialysis. You notice how I say the word assisted dialysis, right? So in a place where that's full assist, and there's patients that will need that. No one's here arguing that we should go back to 1973 and then who lives and who dies, and then, oh, if you can't do home dialysis, then you're dead. I mean, no one's saying that. I think what we're saying is can we elevate the patients that we feel can do more, and we always can, there's always going to be a place where we do, just like hospitals. We, the hospitals aren't going to go away. We're doing a lot of outpatient hospital stuff, like home infusions, home physical therapy, but there needs to be a safety valve for patients that just aren't doing well, right, sicker. And, but there are some subset of those patients that can do more, and that's really what we're talking about. So we need to have a sort of a hub of this, and how do we promote home? How do we promote home first? And how, do we, how are we there to part of the process to support them? And then really tracking your clinical outcomes, your metrics. And it starts with leadership and working together as a team. So again, this is just, I'll talk about this a little bit later this, this, um, at this meeting. We'll talk about transitional care. This is a few articles that have been coming out in the last year or so that get at some of these concepts of looking at your in-center and see if you could actually bring in a different model with the current center to start sort of adding and ex adding more accessibility and perhaps translating to better clinical outcomes and better home dialysis um, uptake. And so my closing thoughts as we kind of finish here and kind of kick this meeting off is really looking at home dialysis therapies continue to be underutilized. I think 30% is very reasonable. I could speak for myself. My practice is about 35% home dialysis. And I, again, I'm not taking care of all MDs and PhDs. You know, I take care of a lot of Pedros and a lot of Sanchez's and so on and so forth. So we could do a little bit of more, right? And it just takes some time and effort working in concert. Frequency, you'll hear again more about this. I mean, I, this, the longer you're on dialysis, the more dialysis you need. It's simple as that. If you're on dialysis, and Dr. Chin will give a nice presentation on incremental um, residual kidney function. And so I think that as you move the needle to more frequency, remove the needle of being, and you start looking at a patient 10 years or seven years on dialysis, it's a different patient than someone just started dialysis. So how do we best utilize what we have and optimize the therapy? And again, patient-centered care, you have to have patient engagement. And we're gonna be all critical 
in this. It's not one person or two people. It's not one doctor or three doctors. Everybody in this room is responsible for that patient. If you touch the patient, whether you're in the front, even you know, in the front lobby or in the back lobby, you have a contact with the patient, we are all responsible for the patient. So we have to all start speaking the same language because we're so running 150 miles an hour and so many sideways that I think oftentimes the patients get lost in the shuffle. So with that being said, I think I will go ahead and um, close it out.